Good afternoon. My name is Lindsay Mintz, and I am the executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm really um, delighted and honored to have been given this opportunity to open today's uh, speaker series. So you are in the right place if you are um, connected to the Boston JCRC, the Indy JCRC, uh, to travel in Israel with amazing guides like Ishai Shavit, who we're going to hear from today. Um, this is going to be a, a really wonderful conversation. I'm really thankful to the JCRC Boston for inviting Indianapolis to co-sponsor today's event. Um, they did so because they know that uh, the Indianapolis JCRC uh, reached out to the Boston JCRC when we were planning uh, a, a study tour for civic leaders in central Indiana. We started planning in 2016 and 2017. Uh, we went in 2018, seems like a lifetime ago, but Jeremy Burton, um, my colleague, was one of the first people I called to say, what's the first thing I need to do? And Jeremy did not skip a beat to say, the guide is the most important thing, period. Who? It's okay. Who? Who? And again, didn't skip a beat. He said, whenever you shy is available, that's when you go. And everything after that is commentary in many ways. Um, so Yishai was the first person that I reached out to and, and the lay leaders who helped plan our mission for civic leaders, uh, what is now um, almost four years ago. And um, Jeremy was absolutely right that not only was Yishai incredibly special, um, which you're all going to learn about uh, in a few minutes, but how critical the educator guide is when you are visiting Israel, especially with, you know, not just people who've never been there, but diverse communities. Um, if you are bringing a, a group who you need to, you know, address lots of learning levels, lots of experiences, exposure, what do you take away? I mean, this is, these can be incredibly exciting but always nuanced conversations. And, um, and Yishai was really, the, in many ways, the reason why our trip was so successful in 2018. I know he is beloved by JCRCs and, and communities probably all over the world, definitely in, in the United States. Um, I know that every time Yishai spoke, I learned um, and I can't wait to read the book. So with that, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, JCRC Boston, for giving me an opportunity to play a, a very small role in welcoming everybody today. And now I'm going to sit back and, and learn alongside all of you um, with this conversation between Jeremy Burton, there you are, and Yishai Shavit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lindsay, uh, and for folks who are here in Boston, I hope this gives our part of today's participant community a little bit of the flavor of the way in which JCRCs around the country, while being very much local autonomous organizations, work with each other, collaborate, learn from each other. I know that I have learned uh, on the topic of how to uh, engage with education around Israel with, from Lindsay, as well as so many other topics. And I know that you know we learn from each other and from many other colleagues around the country, and we're constantly going back and forth saying, how do we do this? What did you do? What works well? What can we all do better in our work? Um, so I just, you know, this is an opportunity, uh, Lindsay, not just to, you know, have you on, but for also for our community here to see a little bit of that sort of collaboration that goes on. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm really, really excited for this conversation. Uh, as people here in Boston know, we at JCRC run two study tours uh, every year to Israel. Uh, and we offer an opportunity for community and faith leaders throughout the Commonwealth to experience Israel from a variety of perspectives, Jews, Muslims, Christians, Israelis, Palestinians, citizens, non-citizens, et cetera, to gain a better understanding of the complexities and challenges facing Israel and the region. And as I'm not gonna repeat it, but as Lindsay says, the essential point we always start from is the educator. Who is going to be with us for eight, nine, 10 days on a bus, in the conference rooms, in the debriefs, helping us think, helping us understand, narrating and interpreting this experience for our groups. And we always start with Yishai, 
uh, as uh, and, and Yishai has now, with the exception of when there has been, you know, conflict that made it un unavailable, has been with us every summer for the last eight years. Uh, and I've also had the privilege several times during those eight years of spending a day or two one-on-one -on -one traveling with Yishai as we continue to find new groups and partners and experiences in Israel that we want to expose our American audiences to. So I'm just gonna be very brief uh, and then turn it over and then we're gonna have a conversation because we're very fortunate that I would say, shall you say, Yishai used his pandemic time well. And together with several of his colleagues, including another guy that we work with on our winter trips, Mike Hollander, put together a book. It's called Heartbeats. It is the Insider's Guide to Israel, an anthology that provides a unique perspective. And I would say, having read it already, that I felt like I was on the bus again. Uh, and so Yishai was the co-editor. He also wrote a number of the chapters. And we're really excited to have him here today uh, to talk about the book to talk about the experience of writing it and about what it's all about. And to also give everybody here, maybe those of you who have not had the experience of traveling Yishai, a little bit of the flavor and the benefit of what it's like to have an incredible educator, a skilled interpreter and a storyteller who really is just so open and available uh, in his experiences uh, when traveling. So Yishai was born on a kibbutz in the Northern part of Israel. And then in 2000, he moved to Jerusalem he has a bachelor's degree in history, focusing on Indian Jewry and contemporary Jewry. He has been guiding educational trips uh, coming to Israel, and he is a political and social activist devoted to making Israel an equal and just society for all. I will now turn it over to Ishai, and we'll start with the question. Tell us, why did you and your colleagues uh, write this book? First of all, I'm honored to be here. And uh, really, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And to see so many people over here, this is really uh, thrilling. So todaraba, thank you very much. Now, as most of you already been to Israel know, uh, a tour to Israel is not just another tour. A tour to Israel, well, Israel and Jerusalem is a place that you heard of when you were two years old, three years old, regardless of the fact whether you are Jewish, Christian or Muslim. It's a different destination. It's not a tour, it is more of a journey than a tour because it leaves it marks on you, no matter what you do. And because of that, we try to uh, look at ourselves not as two guides, but as two educators. And we came with this philosophy that you really need to show people coming to Israel all the different pieces of the puzzle or the mosaic that makes Israel to be what it is. And you, have, and you really have to do that in the most honest way possible. And because of COVID, we thought it's time to simply to write what we're doing and just to uh, have all of those chapters and letters and everything uh, put into a book. And that's what we did. Uh, I have a couple of questions I wanna start with and I'm gonna invite the audience you know, we, to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. I know that everybody's gotten used to how to use that over 18 months and uh, you know, love to hear people's questions. And I, for those of you, I know there are people in the audience who traveled with Yishai and had this experience, feel free to you know, throw your question in too. Don't feel like if this is just for the newbies. Um, but before we go there, so this book, who is the audience you're really speaking to? Is it Americans? And I say this, when we were talking about this before, you know, we talked about this last week, you know, I'm always struck by when Israelis write a book about your country. And like, there are Israelis who write it in Hebrew and it gets published in Israel. And then I follow sort of the conversation amongst Israelis and it doesn't end up in English till years later. And then there are Israelis who write a book in English and it's actually published here. And like, then all the Americans are asking guides about the book when they're on the, you know, when they're there. And like the Israelis haven't even read it. And so you clearly wrote this, I mean, it's certainly been published first in English. So what was the choice there, writing it in English, publishing in English, and what's your audience here? So the book was written for people who are uh, thinking of visiting Israel for the first time in their life, to people during their first significant visit to Israel, and I'm not talking about bar mitzvah, okay? I'm talking about significant to as an adult to Israel. And for people who really want to process their uh, time, the, the time that they spent in Israel. Uh, basically, North Americans. 
uh, people who are coming to Israel who really want to learn more about the country, not only just to uh, uh, say that they've been to Jerusalem, okay? Uh, people who really want to learn, to learn more. The book is also good for pilgrims, even though it is not focusing on the pilgrimage. And I'm, and I'm talking about Jewish pilgrimage, Christian pilgrimage, Muslim pilgrimage. It's for the, the pilgrim who really want to, to know Israel uh, better. I like to say that this book is the book that I would like to hold in my hand when I go to a new country, a country that I haven't been to uh, before. Uh, there are 22 people who uh, participated in writing this book. Some of us wrote uh, the articles in Hebrew. Some of us wrote it in English. And the articles that were written in Hebrew were translated to English, to American English, not to a British English, because we believe that most of the audience, the relevant audience uh, that will read this book and come to Israel are North Americans. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, this is a little bit of a, this is a little bit of a book party for you and we're very excited and celebrating for you. And it's also a little bit of a, you know, inviting an American audience in to hear a guide. Um, I'm curious what that was like as, as a, as a co-editor, what that was like for you in terms of like working with all of these different guides, collecting all this, um, deciding what stories to put in, you know, you know, what not to put in, were there, were there things that you decided not to do? So uh, it, first of all, it was a lot of fun. You can <laughs> imagine when COVID started, uh, the tourism industry all over the world, collapsed and we haven't seen each other for a couple of months before we decided, well, it's about time uh, to write a book. So uh, my two colleagues, Gilad Pellet and uh, Yaakov Fried and uh, myself sat down uh, in my home in Jerusalem and we came with this idea and we, had, we were thinking about what do we want to include in, in this book? And we're thinking, who do we know from the tourism industry who can provide, uh, who can give us a good story, simply tell a good story, which is relevant and educational. And it's not always that easy to find the right tour guide who is an amazing tour guide in the field, but also can uh, write uh, the story in an interesting way. Um, it took us a while. But I think that we were able to, uh, to fill all the different pieces of the puzzle and to find the right uh, people who uh, wrote uh, the articles that we we're thinking about. So, so to build on that, and it's, I know something you and I have discussed, when we are working together and you are uh, with us uh, in Israel, you know, for our groups as part of our commitment to providing a diversity of perspectives, a lot of different ways of seeing this place that we mostly know as Americans through certain media and very selectively. One of the things we, you know, in addition to taking people north and south to meet Russians and Orthodox and Mizrahi and men and women and like the left, the right, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we also always engage with the Palestinian Arab sector. And I know depending on who that is and what somebody's identity is, they use different words. And in your book, I know that you have um, Israeli citizens or at least one Israeli citizen who is identifies with the Arab Palestinian sector uh, who contributed to the book. I also know that when we work with you, we always go to the West Bank and there are guides who are licensed either by the Palestinian Authority or other, other vehicles who are friends of yours who you work with, who you hand us off for the day or for half a day or whatever we're doing with them. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, in the book, there are none of those, shall we say, Palestinians who are not citizens of the state of Israel, who also work in the guiding industry. Those voices aren't in this book. And I'm you know, curious to hear sort of like what that choice reflects for you and your colleagues as the authors. So uh, first of all, I could come and say, well, just take the easy, uh, or give you the, the easy answer that the book deals with Israel and Israeli citizens only, but that will be a lie, okay? You cannot understand Israel without the point of view of the Palestinians. And of course, there are Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, like uh, Nadia Mahmoud Gayul, who wrote one of the articles, uh, but it's relatively easy to write an essay or an article about your life when you are a citizen, who have full rights of a citizen. 
It is a completely different issue when you're not a citizen of Israel, when you're a Palestinian living in the West Bank. And our original plan, of course, was to include a story like that, at least one, we were thinking of having it two or more, okay, but at least one in the book. Uh, we actually had an idea. We were thinking of the Palestinian writer to write about a checkpoint. What does it mean a checkpoint? Okay, what does it mean for him, for him or for her to go through a checkpoint? Um, what does it mean that the area where you can travel ends at a checkpoint? What does it mean to cross a checkpoint with your child? What does it mean to cross a checkpoint with your tourist that can go back and forth, but you as a Palestinian, as a Palestinian, not always, depends on uh, uh, the limitations or where exactly you are uh, crossing. And we knew exactly who we want to, uh, who do we want to write this article? And we called the person and he agreed. And he wrote an article that I found to be a good article. And then he told me, then he called me and said, no. Mm. And he told me, well, to talk to a group on a bus, it's great. It's wonderful, but to have everything printed on a book where I live in a place which, well, where I don't really have full citizen rights, where tomorrow someone who is not gonna be happy with what I wrote, whether an Israeli or a Palestinian, I can pay a very heavy price for that. And I have four young daughters and I cannot, uh, I, I simply don't wanna take the chances. Okay, so we called another tour guide and another one. And on the fourth one, we realized that it's not going to work. Uh, so I find it to be a tragedy that people are too scared to, uh, to, write, uh, to write their own opinion about the conflict and about the checkpoint and to print it on a book. And don't, let's not forget, this is a book which is printed in Israel and by Israelis. And some of the articles are Zionist articles that deals with army, that deals with the political issues. I can understand why a Palestinian will not feel comfortable in this uh, kind of a house, but I'm sorry to say that uh, because of that, uh, we cannot really give you the full uh, picture of what's going on in Israel. Uh, I, I, I'm really glad that, we, uh, that I asked that question, that you encouraged me to ask that question because uh, that, that is a, um, a fascinating story and it really gets at uh, what you always, you know, the complexity of telling the story of a place and the people who are there and what the reality is between what we might read versus what people actually are able to say when they're saying it without being recorded or really the, the difference between reading an article in the newspaper in America versus actually going and talking to all sorts of people in the place. Like, and you just, that, just that right there just, you know, just captures the fundamental difference between reading books about Israel, sitting here versus actually going and engaging with all sorts of people on the ground. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for being very honest and open about that. Oh, we're starting to get a bunch of questions, um, some of which I'm really excited to get to. Uh, but I want to do one more thing, which is a bit of a pro uh, sort of a, the process of the editing and of the book uh, was how you thought about the ordering of the sections. And it's for people, so for people who um, haven't read the book, and obviously, we, I encourage people to read the book. Uh, we will throw in a link uh, to it on Amazon in a few minutes. But, um, you know, it, it, it has some deliberate sections to the book. Uh, there's an order, there's a story being told here. And I'm curious what you could say about, you know, the, the Seder of the book, the order of the book, uh, not just the content. So, uh, yeah, the most important thing for us was not to start with the geopolitics because uh, we know, because we guide people on the ground, that uh, people's first questions usually are about the geopolitics. And just look at ourselves today, okay? The first question that uh, we were dealing with was with the political question. And it's an obvious question. Everyone wanna know that the conflict is a, is a living conflict. We live, we hear, we hear about this conflict almost on a daily basis. And we decided that we don't wanna start with that. So the first few uh, essays uh, or articles in the book 
uh, are, and by the way, they're all coming from a personal perspective. They're not a book, they, are not, they were not written by people from the academia, even though some of the writers have PhDs. Um, but it comes from a personal perspective, a perspective of a tool guide. And the thing is that we didn't, that we wanted to start with culture because we truly believe that if you don't understand the Israeli culture, there is no way that you can understand the Israeli politics. You cannot understand the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You cannot understand minorities in Israel. You cannot understand, you cannot understand the country. So we started just after uh, those essays that deal with the size of the country and the state of mind of the Israelis, we started with culture. And for me, this is a very important message. And we did it uh, deliberately just to, uh, just for people to know that uh, there is life over here, which is sometimes much more important than uh, those big questions of uh, the conflict or politics or uh, minorities or uh, other issues. So as the interviewer here, I'm now taking notes that next time ask the author, the editor about the culture and the vibe of the book before we get into the politics of the book and the process there. Okay, <laughs> good feedback. Um, we'll make sure on our next trip, you know, maybe, maybe we'll do uh, the first day we will I'll ask you to take us to a museum and not wait until like the last day or something. To a concert. To a concert. concert. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that is something I don't think we've ever done with you on one of our trips is go to a concert. Um, we should probably, that would be interesting. I know we've done some other art stuff more in recent years, but that would be fun. Um, yeah, look, I, you know, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking about my experience when I'm with you as an educator and you reference the sort of like giving people the experiences if they were, uh, had the opportunity to experience this place with, and to travel in Israel with a guide. And you know, I know that this is a, a compilation that you have many colleagues and you know, certainly want to hear anything you have to say about like some of those colleagues and who they are. But I was also very struck about your own pieces in the book and the way, and that's, I think it goes to how you share yourself. Um, and one of the pieces that you wrote for the book yourself is about Masada. And uh, as I read it, I could remember us being <laughs> on the top of Masada and I heard your voice there. So I'm curious, I, I wanna invite you to like, for this audience, like tell a little bit of that story, tell a little bit of how you would educate at the top of Masada and the story you're telling there uh, for our audience. So uh, those of you who haven't been to Masada, because not all the JCRC uh, tools uh, eventually gets to Masada, um, either because uh, fl flash floods Indianapolis, or uh, because uh, of uh, time limits and uh, agenda. Um, so Masada is a mountain at the end of, the, of nowhere. It's in the middle of the desert. Okay, King Herod built a palace over there. Uh, 70 years uh, uh, later, the Jews who revolt against the Romans, built their fortifications over there. The Romans came after they destroyed Jerusalem. They put a siege around Masada. Masada they conquer it after a year or so, okay? But that's not the real story. The story over there is the story of the Jews, the zealots who revolt against the Romans, who simply prefer to commit suicide than to fall to the hands of the, of the Romans. So if you go to Masada, that's the story that you get. But as we already mentioned, this book is not about take a look to your left hand side, this is Masada, take a, take a look to the right side, this is the Dead Sea. This book is about what can you understand about the Israeli culture and the Israeli state of mind from, from a visit to Masada, for example. And uh, I named this chapter, okay, uh, after a, a verse from the book of uh, Numbers. And it's called, A People That Shall Dwell Alone, question mark. And if you look at the story of Masada, you can understand that Israel needs to be a special place. Israelis need to, to be like, they live on a mountain in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, okay? We need to be strong. We will, uh, we will fight and we will uh, live as free men or we will die by uh, trying and stay uh, uh, free people, okay? Masada shall never fall again. Israel shall never fall again. That was the ethos. This is how Israelis live their life uh, for many, many years. 
It's like Ehud Barak, our former prime minister, used to call it a villa in the jungle. Okay, that's one way of looking at Masada. That's one way of looking at the Israeli politics. Okay, we need to take care of ourselves and we don't care about what's going on around us. The, the other way that you can look at this story is by looking at the story of another rabbi who lived in those days, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who said, no, I realize that Jerusalem is lost and I'm going to collaborate with the Romans, the same Romans who destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And I'm going to take part in their political game. And Israelis still today, some Israelis think that Israel should not be like Masada that shall never fall again. Jerusalem, uh, Israel needs to behave like this rabbi who said, hmm, we are a part of a bigger picture. We need to collaborate with others. So that's one thing that you can learn in Masada and then take a look at the whole political map of Israel and realize that we are dealing with the same question. Same question that people uh, were dealing with uh, 2000 years ago at the top of a mountain at the end of nowhere. Thank you. Uh, I wanna ask you, uh, cause that was something that's in the book, a chapter that you wrote that really evoked for me experiences I've had with you. Uh, another experience I've had with you, which is not in the book. Uh, is going to hand-in-hand -hand schools. Uh, and for folks in our audience here, uh, certainly people in Boston know that we have this uh, initiative called Boston Partners for Peace here at JCRC uh, in partnership with CJP, uh, which is really a commitment to lifting up, investing in, and supporting organizations on the ground who are committed to building a shared society and building a society in which Israelis and Palestinians are interacting with each other, seeing each other, hearing each other's narratives. And one of the organizations that we support and we try to take every group we can is the Yad Biyad, the Hand in Hand Schools. Uh, and you are not only an educator who takes us there, you're also a parent there. And this summer, you and I had the opportunity to spend a day doing some uh, travel on our own. It was a real blessing for me to be able to get back to Israel uh, fairly early on my own, or at least on a different kind of mission. And we went to the school in Jerusalem where you are a parent. And we had a very interesting conversation with you and another parent about uh, being a parent during COVID and some of the aspects of why you send your kids to that school and even some of what you got to see about that school during this uh, period at home. And I'm wondering if, I'm hoping you can speak to some of that because I found it very interesting and powerful. Uh, so first of all, uh, yeah, this is a special school. Uh, there are six schools, hand-in-hand uh, -hand schools uh, in Israel. For those of you who don't know, the Israeli uh, education system is, uh, well, I like to call it separated. Okay, you can choose where you want to send your kids to a Jewish school, to a Jewish Orthodox school, to a Jewish ultra-Orthodox school, or to an Arab school. You can choose as a parent where to send your, your where you to send your kids, but I have not met yet the ultra orthodox Haredi Jew who decided to send his six years old son to an Arab school. Okay, so because of that, we don't really get to meet each other. Ultra orthodox don't know how modern orthodox think. Okay, uh, Palestinians Israelis don't know how uh, liberal is Israeli Jews think and so on and so forth. Hand in hand school try to give an answer uh, to all of that. You wanna study with, uh, let's say uh, Palestinians, you're an Israeli Jew, you can do that in hand in hand school. Uh, roughly 50% of the people, of the, of the students are Jewish, 50% of the students are Arabs. Some of them are in Jerusalem, some of them are Israeli citizens and some of them are not, are permanent residents of Israel who live in East Jerusalem. And uh, this year, the, last year we celebrated 20 years for this school. It goes from kindergarten to high school. And uh, I have two kids there. Uh, I have a kid in the third grade and a kid in the fifth grade. And uh, I can tell you that for me, the fact that they have uh, an Israeli Jewish teacher and a Palestinian uh, teacher who is either Israeli or East Jerusalemite, is wonderful. The fact that he needs to uh, deal with the uh, cultural diversity from day one at school, it's wonderful. Uh, the fact that he learn, uh, that they learn Arabic, uh, not only Hebrew and English, is great. That's what I want from this school. 
But of course, it's not always easy. Uh, so most, most of you have been to this school, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, during COVID, um, it wasn't easy, as you can imagine. Nothing is easy. Um, COVID started in Israel. Um, well, when it started, there was a, a big problem at school because some of the students are coming from Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is a Palestinian city in area A, which basically means that they couldn't come to Israel, not because of, uh, I don't know, this uh, security threat or another, but because of COVID. Bethlehem was, Bethlehem was closed. The West Bank, people could not travel from the West Bank into Jerusalem. And now you have a school, okay? And some of the, some of the students, some of the kids cannot show up. What do you do? Later on, uh, Zoom. Uh, Zoom for all teachers around the world was not easy. Uh, now, uh, if you are a Palestinian teacher and many of the Palestinians living in East Jerusalem are coming from a very conservative uh, homes, which means that the entire family is together at the same house. And that includes the 90 years old grandfather and the 90 days uh, old uh, baby. And you need to be functional. You need to help your, uh, your parents, your grandparents and your kids. And you need to be a teacher and you need to learn how to activate, uh, the, the, how to work through Zoom. Let's say the first few months were uh, a real challenge for teachers, for students, uh, but I think that we got over it and it was, uh, this will be a year that they will remember and they will remember it as, as a good year, as a good year for, uh, for students because they were able to acquire some skills that uh, without COVID, I'm not sure about that. Thanks. I, I'm curious, uh, and maybe this is a more complicated conversation, but uh, when we were talking about your experience as a parent, at this school during COVID, uh, look, all parents I know and you know got a new insight into what's going on in their schooling and their education, whether they were effectively functioning as a teacher's assistant, you know, in their children, you know, at the dining room table, or because they can now hear every word in the classroom while they were trying to do their own work, you know, on the other side of the living room. Lots of parents had a very new insight into their schools uh, during COVID. And you shared with me when we were at the school this summer uh, how the hand-in-hand -hand schools navigate certain spaces that are culturally and politically fraught between the Israeli and Palestinian students like Yom Atzmut, in Israeli Independence Day. And that you had never, you know, you knew about that programming, but you hadn't seen it yourself. So I'm curious, like, as a parent getting to see that navigation for the first time over Zoom, what, what, what that was like for you and uh, what that showed you or thought about? Uh, so first of all, those two days, the Memorial Day uh, for soldiers who died on duty and Independence Day are uh, very important days uh, for Israelis, Israeli Jews. For us, that's like uh, a sacred day. Um, and I'm not talking about Independence Day because Independence Day is a day off in Israel. Schools are off. I'm talking about, I remember, uh, the Memorial Day. And um, if you grow up in an Israeli Jewish society, uh, unfortunately, there is a good chance that you know someone who lost his life while serving in the army. If you grow up in a Palestinian society, unfortunately, you know people who lost their life in the conflict. So who is the hero over here? Who is the victim over here? When you send your kids to the same school and you don't, agree with the politics of everyone in school. And of course, no one agrees, just think of yourself. Do you agree with the politics of all of the parents in your school? Of course you don't, no one does. Um, but over here, there is, a, there is a real conflict and there is a big issue. And uh, on Independence Day, or excuse me, on Memorial Day, usually what this school is doing is a, a separate ceremony. The only thing that they do during this year, during the entire year separately, is this ceremony. The Palestinian goes go to 
a Palestinian oriented ceremony that deals with the Nakba, the catastrophe of the Palestinian. And the Israelis are going to, a, the Israeli Jews are going to a different one, to a ceremony that deals with the loss of life uh, among the uh, soldiers and among their uh, family members. And at the end of those two services, they go together to uh, one service that deals with how much we need peace. Uh, so during COVID, we actually uh, were able to take, play, uh, to take uh, part of, uh, in all of this. And uh, to tell you the truth, it was, uh, it was very interesting. Also for me as a father, it was very challenging. I can, I, I'm sure it's also very, very challenging for the teachers uh, because this is like a national school, okay? You, it's Ministry of Education. Sometimes you as a teacher uh, don't really get to choose that this is the school that you want to teach in. That's your job. And now you need to deal with the narrative that you do not agree with. Maybe a narrative that you never heard of. And you think of your family and what will they say? Okay, let's say that you grow up in a Palestinian uh, uh, family and some of your uh, uh, family members uh, support Hamas, for example. Okay, it can happen. Uh, Hamas won the election in Jerusalem in 2006. Uh, can you really be the person who is willing to respect the Israeli Jewish kids in your class who are mourning, who are thinking of a family member who lost his life while serving in the army? Uh, not an easy question, not an easy question. By the way, uh, speaking of the future, this year, Memorial Day and Eid al-Fitr are the same day. So uh, it's going to be an extra challenging day. From one end, you have maybe the most important holiday uh, in Islam, and people will be happy, and people will go to see their families, and people will uh, 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 give uh, gifts and eat sweets. And on the other side, you'll have the Israeli kids who are uh, uh, remembering uh, their family members who lost their life in the conflict. So... It's all over Israel. That's going to be an interesting day. It'll be an interesting day. And this is part of what it means to learn to live in a shared society. Um, you know, we, we aren't always quite as conscious of that, our own relationship here in America to being, say, Jews in a Christian society or people of different backgrounds. You know, we navigate this in a very different way, I think. And it's really fascinating to see for you personally, for the students, for the school, and for all the shared society organizations that we get to experience on our visits, how this is an evolving conversation that's happening. Um, switching gears and like some of the questions that, you know, there are people in, there are people who have questions who are uh, very excited, I think, about having traveled with you or looking forward to travel with you. So I wanna get to a couple of that, those now. Um, so Barry Glass, uh, former part of the JCRC team, uh, hi Barry, um, noted something that I was also struck by uh, in a different way, and I'll say it, uh, and I said this to you at the time um, that we talked about this, that uh, if I had imagined what would be your first book, I assumed it was going to be a book of photography. Uh, and as Barry notes, you know, one of the things, you know, you, may, you are an incredible storyteller and educator, but you are also an incredible photographer, and we should probably throw a link to your Instagram account in here somewhere, because every day on Instagram, you post one picture of the day, and when uh, you know, those of us who've had the opportunity to travel with you, first of all, the pictures are gorgeous, amazing, like professional, like really talented photography, but also it's interesting to watch you throughout the day and think, what are you going to take a picture of? And, you know, if somebody travels with you shy, you know, every once in a while you see shy, all of a sudden it's like turn and stop and like wander off for a second and whip out his camera and take a picture. And you want to, is that, is that the moment? Um, so I guess Barry's question, and it's a great question, is when you choose to publish your one picture a day, what are you looking for? Uh, how does it relate at all to your interest in the work of education that you are doing uh, with the groups you're traveling with? It's a wonderful question. So uh, in the last seven and a half years, I've been doing that one photo a day. And I started with that because, and first, and hi, Barry. Hi. <laughs> uh, Barry, I've been to my place uh, so where I'm, uh, where I'm uh, actually sitting right now. Uh, anyhow, um, where was I? Um, one, one photo a day. 
I started with that because, well, I guided in Masada several times before. And I was thinking, hmm, the last thing I want to I want to be, I want I don't really want to be a boring tool guy. I want I want to I want to be an interesting tool guy. I want people to, to listen to me. And I realized that if I'm gonna tell the same story again and again and again and again, I'm gonna be bored. And if I'm gonna be bored, you guys are gonna be bored. So I was thinking, how can I have a twist uh, in the story that I tell? And I said, hmm, what about a, a photo? Every day I will force myself to look at this place where I am from a different angle. So what I'm looking for is something that I didn't do before. A different photo, a different angle, maybe a different person. That's one thing that I'm looking for. And the second thing, I'm looking for the story. Okay, the story that makes, that makes the photo more interesting. A story behind the photo. Again, it can be the story of a person, that can be the story of the place, but at the end of the day, it creates this mosaic, like the book, of what uh, Israel is, uh, is all about. So uh, those, book, those, those photos are not professional. <laughs> okay, I take them for my, uh, with my phone and I uh, add filters to all of them, uh, but that's like a game that I uh, play and I find it to be uh, actually very nice and it uh, opens my eye, it opened my eyes to all different kinds of things that without it, there is uh, no way that I could uh, see them. Well, uh, that's incredibly illuminating. And I, for one, still think that your next book should be a book of photography. Um, so <laughs> I'll keep making, I certainly would buy that book. Uh, and speaking of buying the book, um, Elisa points out uh, that the physical copy, you know, we'll post a link on Amazon uh, where the Kindle version is available, but a physical copy of the book is not currently available. So. For people who are listening and are fascinated by your story, where can they buy the book? Okay, that's a, that's a painful question because all the copies that we sent to, uh, to Amazon uh, were sold, the hard copies. And you know that this year is a little bit of a challenging year for uh, uh, shipping all kinds of goods from one place to another. Uh, same goes for books. Uh, so we uh, already shipped a whole uh, bunch of new books to Amazon. The books were published in Israel by an Israeli company, and they should be in the States uh, any day. So I'm sorry for this uh, balagan. Those of you who travel with me know this <laughs> word, okay, uh, this mess. Uh, but that's a good one because uh, it means that we were able to sell all of the first uh, few books that we sent to the States. So I'm actually happy with this balagan. Good. It is never people a bad, are buying the book. It's never a bad thing to sell out your first print run. Uh, and I guess for Eliza and everybody else, uh, pre-order, create, you know, show them that there's demand and get yourself in line for the next batch when they come. Uh, I want to talk a little bit. And there's some questions about this as well. I want to talk about expectations. Uh, expectations is a big part of what we talk about when we go uh, with a group on a study tour. It's an expectation is a big part of what comes up on the bus. What do people assume about a place? What do people expect to see? What do you expect from the people who are coming here? So uh, there's a question here from someone who I believe, I don't want to say his name because I'm not 100% certain that he's already signed up. I believe he is planning to come on our next uh, uh, trip with you this summer. And so, uh, you know, he's going to have, you know, hopefully you'll have the opportunity to meet him. But like coming to Israel as part of a study group with a JCRC or some of the other American groups that you work with, what would somebody expect? Is it going to be a tourist experience? Is it going to be something that's mental, emotional, spiritual? Is it about a special place? Like, what are you looking and what should somebody expect if they're going to spend a week with you? Okay, that's a wonderful question. I can talk about that for an hour or so. But I will say something that I will, if you're about to come to the tour and, uh, to the, uh, in, uh, in the summer, during the summer, I will tell that on the bus, on your way from, uh, your, from the airport to the, first, to, the, to the first stop. I will tell you that I, want, I would like to ask you to put yourself in the shoes of the Israelis. Because what you bring with you, the expectations, what you're thinking of, can, your judgment uh, can 
basically interfere with your studies, the study of Israel. You, you're going to meet different people. And it doesn't really matter whether you are on a JCRC tour or a bar mitzvah tour. You'll get to meet Israelis, different Israelis. You have to put yourself in their shoes in order to understand how they think. If you don't understand how they think, you don't understand Israel. Israel is not about the site, it's about the people. So, of course, you want to see the holy sites. It goes without saying, but you're not on a, not on a pilgrimage. You're going to be fo- you will be focusing on Israel and the Israelis. And what we will, we will give you is the opportunity to have a better understanding of Israel than most Israelis do. Because you're gonna cro- you will cross what I like to call glass borders, borders that don't really exist, but they do exist in, the, in our minds of the Israeli state of mind. Okay, that's the, part, the place where we will never go to, or those are the people that we will never talk to. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Palestinian, an Israeli, a Muslim, a Christian, a Jew, it doesn't matter. Okay, but us Israelis, we don't cross those uh, borders while you will be able to do that. That's, the, that's the, the biggest thing, the biggest gift that the JCRC uh, tour uh, gives you, a real understanding of Israel. And after you'll get back home, you can read the list of the expectations that you uh, prepared or you wrote before you came, or then you can start having a better judgment of what's going on here. And then you can express your uh, opinion uh, to everyone who is willing to, uh, to hear you and everyone will understand that you, you did a real effort in, in order to study what's going on here, an effort that us Israelis sometimes are uh, not willing uh, to do. Wow. Um, I hope that entices those who are here who are thinking about signing up for a study tour with the JCRC or other similar organizations that entices them to say, I, I need to go. Uh, I actually want to flip that on the head now and ask sort of like, I don't know if this is like the reverse question, but a very different version. Like, so for like someone like myself or nominated my deputy director, who's done, I don't even know how many uh, study tours with you at this point, or for Lindsay, uh, those of us who have done lots of these, and you've clearly done a lot of them. And I know that there are like weeks because we talked about like where you've gone to like Yad Vashem, the Israel's national Holocaust Memorial two or three times, even in a week, or like you've clearly gone to Masada way more than the average Israeli. And I've gone to Masada way more than the average Israeli at this point. I, the flip side of that, so like, what should people expect? What the experience is like, what is it that we still don't understand? Those of us who've been on 10, 20 of these study tours, those of us who have the privilege of traveling regularly with experienced educators, what are the misconceptions that we're still holding? What are we not, even, even we're not still seeing that you would love you know, if I was designing the next tour, this is like you, you would add in that we're still not seeing. Oh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And it's not an easy one uh, to answer. Um, I don't know whether it's the good thing or, the ba- or a bad thing about Israel, but reality over here changes very, very quickly. So a tour that was relevant and the right tour to do two years ago is not the right tour to do anymore. Um, and uh, one of the w- wonderful things about the uh, JCRC tours is that they don't deal with the past. They deal with the present and with the future. The past is important to understand what's going on here. I'm not saying uh, that you can ignore the, whole, the old city of Jerusalem. You cannot understand this land without, under, without visiting the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or the Western Wall. Okay, but uh, things are dynamic. And you really need to, to have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in Israel in order to be relevant to, uh, to what's going on. I'll give you an example. Uh, three years ago, everyone was stay, uh, talking about uh, one of the uh, bills or the law, uh, the nation state law that was legislated in the Israeli Knesset, in the parliament. And now if you'll come, no one talks about that anymore. Okay, so if three years ago you were ignoring this, uh, the nation state law, so you basically told a story which is not relevant. But if you focus on this law today, you are not really relevant uh, because it's uh, almost history. And we moved on 
and maybe so one or two of the speakers will mention it, but it's not going to be at the center of uh, one's uh, uh, talk. Uh, for example, I'll give you another example. Next time that you'll come to Israel and you will deal with the political situation in Israel, um, you are used to hear a speaker that tells you that Israelis vote about security. But now, during two years, we had four election rounds that didn't deal with security. It was either you support Netanyahu or you don't support Netanyahu. And if you don't really get to meet someone who is a Netanyahu supporter and someone who demonstrated against Netanyahu, you don't understand what's going on in Israel today. Okay, so uh, that's one of the things that uh, I believe makes, uh, makes it very interesting also for people who've been to Israel on many uh, missions uh, to come back and plan uh, the next one. Yeah, I always, um, I always find that as someone who gets to go two or three times a year for this last year, I always find even when we are meeting with some of the same people on each visit, uh, I'm fascinated to see how their concerns, their priorities are evolving every six months or every year. And you know, I, you know what, what part of their story they are choosing to tell us as Americans has certainly evolved over the years. So I'm more also, also noticing that, which keeps each trip fresh, fresh for myself. Uh, last question, because you know, the, the hour has gone by very quickly. Uh, at least it feels like it has for me. Uh, is there a next book in the works and is it going to be a photography book? <laughs> so yes, there is another book. Uh, almost, uh, we almost uh, finished writing this book. We're almost done. And it's not going to be a photography book. <laughs> it's, and it's not going to be called Heartbeats, but The Beating Heart. And the audience this time will not be uh, just the uh, North American uh, audience. It is uh, more uh, Jewish oriented kind of a book because it deals with Jewish communities around the world. It's about uh, 40 different uh, essays or chapters uh, that tells the story of 40 different communities uh, from the point of view of a community member, whether someone who lives there today or someone who lived there hundreds of years ago and uh, shed a light on this community which, and basically explain a little bit what makes this community different and what is the Jewish experience that you can get by uh, focusing on this story while visiting, for example, Marrakesh in Morocco, Kuchin in India, or uh, Krakow, uh, Poland. Okay, so uh, 40 uh, different essays about 40 different communities. Um, and, that, and we are doing that in order, in order to encourage people to look for another angle when they travel to different destinations. They, uh, some people like food, so they focus on food. Some people like, I don't know what. Now you can focus on different things while you are uh, touring and it makes your tour to be a unique one. And so we offer the Jewish lenses. So uh, that's what the, the next book is all about. And hopefully in about a couple of months, uh, we're gonna be uh, able to publish it. So I actually have a follow-up question to my last question. Uh, and thinking back to the beginning of this conversation, uh, Heartbeats, has been published first in English because you're speaking to a North American audience and the largest Jewish community in the world, the majority of the world's Jews live in Israel. So will the next book be published in Hebrew first? Uh, so no, it ah. is, but, the, but, but not like heartbeats. Heartbeats, we will not translate the heartbeats uh, to Hebrew because it's for first timers. Uh, even though the president of Israel, President Rivlin, the former president uh, who wrote an endorsement for the book said it's also good for Israelis. Um, so um, the next one, we're thinking of translating it uh, to Hebrew because it is relevant to Israeli uh, audience. So most probably it's going to be published first in English and then we're going to translate it uh, to Hebrew. Great. Yishai, it's uh, wonderful to see you. Uh, it's always, I, I just get so much joy just listening to you and learning from you. And I just want to thank you for joining us today. And again, to congratulate you and your colleagues on this publication. And this is just a real gift to all of us who want to see and experience and attempt to understand Israel. And again, you can purchase a copy of this book. We'll link it in the chat. Uh, 
And you can learn more about JCRC's work in Israel, including our study tours for civic leaders, which we are hoping to start doing again in 2022 with Yishai and Boston Partners for Peace, which was referenced when we were talking about Hand in Hand. We'll include a link to that in the chat as well. I wanna thank our colleagues at the Indianapolis JCRC and Lindsay for being part of this and for being our partners, our thought partners in this work and our colleagues in so much other work that we do get to do on behalf of our communities. We have several speaker series coming up in the next couple of weeks. You can check them out on our website and you can register as well there. And we'll include a link in our chat for those. And finally, I'd like to just say, please join JCRC and CJP, Boston's Jewish Federation, for a community-wide menorah lighting on Monday, November 29th at 6.15 p.m. at the New England Holocaust Memorial. This is part of a national initiative, so there may be one in your community if you're joining us from elsewhere, called Shine a Light on Anti-Semitism. We're gonna to gather together on the second night of Hanukkah with our community, our interfaith partners and civic leaders and elected officials to publicly reaffirm our commitment to teaching about the consequences of unchecked hate and bigotry. You can find out more information about that on jewishboston.com. Again, my thanks to Yishai and to everybody here today. It is always a joy to spend time with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.